The 10th commandment calls us to not covet. We're going to be talking about the 10th command, commandment. This is the uh, 11th video as we go through the 10 commandments, and there's going to be 12 in total uh, because I want to keep each of the 10 commandments as their own separate video with the intro, and I will be doing one more as a quick conclusion wrapping up Exodus chapter 20. Now, this commandment is rather unique in comparison, and we're going to talk about that. Let me pray, and we're going to get into this. Um, there's a lot to learn. Covetousness can be very destructive, but it's very unique amongst the Ten Commandments in our culture today. And I'll explain. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you've given us your commandments, your guide for us to live by. Lord, I pray that you will open our hearts, our minds, and that we will be receptive to you. I pray that you will speak through me, that these will be your words, not mine. Thank you, Lord. Be here now. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So coveting can lead to so much more. Uh, well, let, let's, I'll explain, but let's read the passage first. Uh, so Exodus chapter 20, verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, this does bring up slavery because it does say your male or female servant now, I'm not going to go down that tangent and, and talk about that, but there is slavery in the Bible. Servants are something that existed in the ancient Near East. It, 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 slavery is something that has existed since um, the beginning of time, basically, um, but it's not the same as we might consider slavery of enslaving one race versus another, or uh, one religious perspective versus another. People in this time, in the ancient Near East, would voluntarily go into slavery in a house because they owed a debt. Um, there were actually different reasons why slavery would happen, and it wasn't, um, it was, it, it's, a different culture, different element, and the Bible always tries to regulate it as you go through and you look at slavery in the Bible. It's a whole other study. I'm not going to go into it right now. We're just dealing with the 10th commandment, which deals with property, of coveting your neighbor's property. But the 10 commandments are both in Deuteronomy as well as Exodus. For those of you who haven't met her, this is one of our two cats, Lily. She is a sweetheart, but she also, when she wants attention, she wants attention and she is distracting. So we'll see if she will go to her bed and just sleep or if she will um, keep distracting me and have to get kicked outside. Oh, she's going to come back again. <laughs> you just stay there. Um, okay, so I want to actually read Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 5 has the Ten Commandments as well, and we've spoken about that before, and anytime there's a unique element that we can learn from reading the Ten Commandments as they're listed in Deuteronomy, I do that. The last four, they've been identical, but this one, there's a slight difference, and I want to go over that. Uh, so this is Deuteronomy 5, verse 21. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house or land, his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So some differences that we have here. One, your neighbor's wife is lifted, listed first as opposed to your neighbor's house. Um, and then you have, rather than it saying covet the second time, it says, uh, you shall not set your desire on your neighbor's house. So we, th it, there's some subtle differences there. It's enough to mention it, but I like the fact that it adds some element to covet being set your desire upon. As we do a word study using uh, blueletterbible.org, the Hebrew word there is hamad, which uh, translates as to desire, covet, to delight greatly in, to desire greatly. 
The International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says to desire earnestly to set your heart and mind upon. The King James Dictionary says to long after, to try to gain. Vine's Expository Dictionary says to fix a desire upon, to long for, to lust after, to covet. To lust after uh, jumps out in my mind is when you are coveting after something, you are lusting for it. So we are called not to lust after something that is not ours. We can paint a very broad stroke with this commandment to be a loose definition of what is our neighbor's. Sorry, kitty, you gotta go. Uh, As I mentioned when we were talking about adultery, uh, my perspective is, is that any woman that is not my wife is my neighbor's wife. And so anybody... Anything that anybody has, I put into this. Me desiring to have something that somebody else has and covering, coveting it, lusting after it in my heart is anybody. It's not just the houses that are directly around me. Everybody is my neighbor. So it's not just defined to that. And on that level, I just want to say real quick, um, it's associated with that as well, is that in Deuteronomy, it says, Uh, You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Pornography. It is 100% coveting. What you are doing, whether you are a man or a woman, in looking at images online, you are lusting after and desiring to have what you do not have. That is, by definition, coveting. You are coveting what you are seeing. And the reason why these commandments exist is because these things that God tells us to stay away from are destructive and will cause harm. Lusting after something that is not yours, no good can come from that, which is why God gives this command to the Israelites in Moses' day, but it still holds true to us today. So there's some other unique elements um, to this commandment. I'm going back to Exodus Uh, just so I have it open here, Exodus 20, verse 17. Um, This is unique in that God does paint a picture. He describes what you're not supposed to covet. So he lists off for the Israelites, your neighbor's wife, uh, your neighbor's house, his male or female servants, oxes, donkeys, anything that belongs to your neighbor. So there's a description that's given. As opposed to the past four, we have no description that's given for, for you know, you're, who are you not supposed to murder? Who are you not supposed to commit adultery with? Who are you not supposed to steal from? Who are you not supposed to lie from? That one does say your neighbor as well. But as I said, neighbor is a very broad stroke. Um, this is also the only commandment that exists entirely in the heart, if that makes sense. And what I mean by that is, is that Well, all these other commandments uh, are things that you would do on an external point of view, but coveting, how do you know if someone is coveting something or not? You can't know. Only God knows. Uh, And one of the things that I want to mention, I want to read is James 1, 14 and 15. Each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. That's what coveting is. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Lusting after something leads to sin when it becomes action. That's when it becomes sin, and it gives birth to death. Thanks be to our Lord Jesus Christ that we are not bound by that, and we are not, that is not our future. Another thing to think about um, is looking at the Ten Commandments. What are the repercussions if you break them? And looking at the last few, if you look at the sixth commandment, uh, honoring life, do not murder. If you break that commandment in our society today, you might get the death penalty depending on where you're at, or you might spend your life in prison. The seventh commandment, honor marriage, do not commit adultery. Well, if you break that one, you could end up having a very expensive divorce, and there'll be social ramifications for this. You have to deal with the repercussions of it. The eighth commandment, to which is the call to um, respect property, don't steal. If you break that one, you'll do prison time. The ninth commandment, speak truth, don't lie. 
If you break that one, that could end in a lawsuit. You could be sued for telling a lie, for being misleading, for uh, uh, giving a false testimony. The 10th commandment, on the other hand, unlike all the other commandments, breaking it is actually embraced by our society today. What do I mean by that? Our Western society the whole economy is based on you lusting after what your neighbors have. Your neighbor has a gets a new 70-inch TV. You see a commercial for an 88-inch TV, and everybody's at your house for the big game. So you lust after it. You desire it. And you want that because you want more than what your neighbor has. And you desire them to be like, oh my gosh, look at that big screen TV. I, it, 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 whatever it is, the whole system marketing, whether it is on television, whether it's on any of the uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney Plus, Paramount, um, all of those, all of those that are now showing commercials, and even the content within those movies and those TV shows are banked after and going after you coveting what they have. And then all the advertising that's part of that and everything that is on our computers, on our phones, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, uh, TikTok, all of those, and then print, and then billboards, all of it, all of it is based on the fact that the 10th commandment is not only supported, but it is embraced. They want you to lust after what your neighbors have. Our economy is based on it, but it's all meaningless. It's all stuff that will leave you empty. And this is why the pursuit of the American dream doesn't end in happiness. Wealthy people don't necessarily, aren't necessarily happy because of their wealth. And we're going to talk about that. An, an interesting thing that happened, just a story that comes to my mind. I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here. My wife and I uh, were celebrating an anniversary. This was a couple years back. And we went to a local a uh, nice restaurant that's attached to a golf course. And it, it was a very nice meal. It was a, a splurge for us, but it was our anniversary. So we wanted to celebrate. And as we come out, I stop in my tracks because there is this gorgeous Lamborghini. And there's a young man and a young woman that are getting into it. And as he gets into it, and these are the doors that go up like this. I can't remember what they're called. They have a fancy name, but the doors go up. And he he helps his uh, trophy girlfriend or wife or you know, I don't know which into the car. And he walks around. And, and as he's going in, he looks over and there's a pair of that I would guess is in their late 40s, early 50s, that's sitting there waiting. They're clearly a little bit more mature. And there's this smug look that he gives uh, as if to say, yeah, everybody, look what I got. So he gets in the car and you can, and, and, and as the cars go around, he peels off and you can actually hear the engine in the Lamborghinis. He must have hit 90 miles an hour going through that golf course. But... The next car that pulls up that belonged to that, that couple that was waiting was a Shelby Cobra. Beautiful car. I love the Shelby Cobra. I would much rather have a Shelby Cobra than a Lamborghini. That's just my personality. Now, I don't know if this was a, an original limited edition actual Shelby Cobra. If it was, it was more expensive than the Lamborghini. Uh, if it was a kit car, it was far less money, but I don't know. I have no idea, but you could hear the bass in this car, not from music, but just from the engine, the guttural as this American muscle car pulls up. And the thing that jumped out to me was what the woman said to the guy as they were getting into their gorgeous automobile. She said some of the most horrible things about the young couple and it made me step back. I mean, we weren't waiting for our car and valet. Our Honda was out in the parking lot. And But I was just sitting here taken aback by these gorgeous automobiles. And the woman was so full of anger and spite and, and vitriol towards... Uh, the young couple with the Lamborghini that that she was she was clearly agitated and and swearing. I'm not gonna repeat what she said, and it made me step back. 
the smug look that the Lamborghini guy gave us, I mean, why do you own a Lamborghini if not to say, look what I have, because you want people to lust after what you have. You desire that recognition and you want to flaunt it. It's pride. It's arrogance. And, and good for him for having that much money. That, that's awesome. I would never spend it on, on cars like these, but whatever. But then the people who had a Shelby Cobra were so upset because they wanted the recognition, but they felt like they were being attacked because of what he had uh, in the Lamborghini. And it was just like, oh my gosh, you guys are nuts. This is all just, it's just stuff. It's going to break. It's going to fall apart. It's causing you all this stress. Nehushtan, uh, that was the um, second commandment, have no idols. And that was uh, from 2 Kings 18, 1 through 7. That's when King Nebuchadnezzar took an idol that the people were worshiping made of bronze and he smashed it. And he said, this is Nehushtan. It's just a thing, a, a, an inconsequential thing of brass. Don't worship it. Coveting something that your neighbor has leads to so much destruction. If you break the sixth commandment, I mean, I already went through all these things that happen. I already went through all of these, but, but the repercussions for breaking the 10th commandment, no one else sees, but they lead to sin and they lead to death. It's the same idea as, as James 1, 14 through 15. It's that lust inside that leads you to commit sin because you desire what you don't have. It, it's pointless. Nehushtan. No good can come from it. I got more Bible verses uh, to read. Money is the root of all evil, right? Not quite. Join me and turn to 1 Timothy, and let's get that verse correct. Money is the root of all evil? No. Uh, 1 Timothy 6.10, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. So for context, let's back up a little bit uh, and pick it up right before verse 3. These are the things you are to teach and insist on. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not agree to the sound instruction of our Lord Jesus Christ and to godly teaching, they are conceited and understand nothing. They have an unhealthy interest in controversies and quarrels about words that result in envy, strife, malicious talk, evil suspicions, and constant friction between people of corrupt mind who have been robbed of the truth and who think that godliness is a means of financial gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Verse 9, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the path and pierced themselves with many griefs. The things that you possess can possess you. Money is not the answer. It is a tool. It is a tool to be used. Uh, join me and read Luke uh, 12. Go to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. And we're going to pick it up on verse 13. Luke 12, 13. So this is the parable of the rich fool. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell me, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I love that. Just some random guy yells to Jesus, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus' response is great. Verse 14, Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter about between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. An interesting thing to note, verse 19, he says, uh, after he rebuilds the larger barns, at that point, he will say, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. It's interesting. So many people live in this mentality that life will be better when. Life will be better when I get that promotion. Life will be better when I get that new job. Life will be better when I finish school and can earn way more money. Life is happening right now around you. Don't let it be driven based on the accumulation of wealth that is just going to chain you down. Money is a tool, but let's just keep going. Do not worry. I want to just want to read a little bit more. Then Jesus said to his disciples, therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you shall eat or about your body, what you will wear for life is more than food and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn yet. God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than birds? Who of you by worrying can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Consider how the wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon, all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it, for the pagan world ruins after, runs after all such things. And your father knows what you need. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys for where your treasure is there, your heart will be also store up good deeds, store up doing things that have repercussions for the kingdom. Matthew 6, 19 through 21, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. One last passage I want to hit from Luke. Let's flip over to Luke 16. And this is our last passage. Luke 16, uh, picking up in verse 9. Luke 16, 9, I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much, and whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. This last commandment is an important one. And it's tough because, as I said, our whole society, our whole uh, system, our economic system is based on you wanting a bigger house than your parents. And I am uh, guilty of that. We have this desire, this this uh, uh, desire to have what other people have. It's human nature. But as Luke advises us, we ought to put our wealth into the important things that have lasting impact. He even straight up says in in Luke 16, 9, use your money for friends. Have it benefit for the here and now that has repercussions in heaven. Don't let your money just go into pointless things that are just going to tie you down 
And don't get caught in the trap of, of coveting what other people have. God has given you all that you need. You are blessed well beyond what you deserve. Pray on that. Focus on that. If you are living a life where you are constantly looking for that next thing to purchase, take some time and ask God to show you what true wealth is. That wraps it up for the Ten Commandments. I'm going to do one more video that finishes Exodus 20 and wraps up all Ten Commandments with a quick little uh, recap of sorts. So thanks for watching. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your Ten Commandments. Thank you for the guide that they are to us to live by. Thank you, Lord, that you don't expect perfection from us. Thank you that they are a guide for us, but that they are not a law that we have to follow. Thank you that we don't achieve righteousness through following these, but that we have imputed righteousness because of what you have done for us on the cross. Lord, I pray that we would be moldable clay and that you being the potter would mold us into what you want us to be. Each of us, each person that's listening or watching this right now, I pray that they will be soft clay that's easily moldable and that you would shape us, that you would guide us for it is you and you alone that changes hearts. And we invite you to change our hearts. And Lord, all of us, every single person that is, that is listening or watching this right now, we covet. We lust after things that our friends have. Help us to realize and see that we are so blessed and have everything that we need in you and that you are the great provider and that we don't need to chase after possession or wealth or status or anything else. We just need you. Thank you, Lord, for that. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. See you guys in the next video.